first of all, may I wish all of you a happy and restful Thanksgiving break. I think all of us feel the need of these days of respite, and I hope that some of the fatigue will be lessened by the opportunity to get away from our usual pursuits. So will you make good use of these days? Greet your parents and your pastors. Say a good word for Augsburg College to some high school senior if you think you can say anything good. And then we hope to see you safely back. Pastor Monsager said that this would be a service of thanksgiving. I'm not so sure that it will turn out to be that. Thanksgiving Day, that's a laugh. I think we ought to be honest. Honest because of a fatal exchange which simply means that we live in a thankless world. We're a part of a thankless race. And you and I are thankless people. There's no one giving thanks. There is nothing to give thanks for. There's one. godless wickedness of men. In their wickedness they are stifling the truth. For all that may be known by God, of God by men lies plain before their eyes. Indeed, God himself has disclosed it to them. His invisible attributes, that is to say, his everlasting power and deity have been visible ever since the world began to the eye of reason in the things he has made. There is therefore no possible defense for their conduct. Knowing God, they have refused to honor him as God or to render him thanks. Hence, all their thinking has ended in futility, and their misguided minds are plunged in darkness. They boast of their wisdom. but they have made fools of themselves. Exchanging, here it is, the fatal exchange, the splendor of immortal God for an image shaped like mortal man who is at the center. Even for images like birds, beasts, and creeping things. For this reason, God has given them up. God has given them up, given them up to the vileness of their own desires and the consequent degradation of their bodies because they have bartered away the fatal trade, the true God for a false one, and have offered reverence and worship to created things instead of to the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. In consequence, I say, God has given them up to shameful passions. Their women have exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural and their men in turn giving up natural relations with women burn with lust for one another, males behave indecently with males, 
and are paid in their own persons the fitting wage of such perversion. Thus, because they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he has given them up, given them up to their own depraved reason. This leads them to break all rules of conduct. They are filled with every kind of injustice, mischief, rapacity, and malice. They are one mass of envy, murder, rivalry, treachery, and malevolence, whispers and scandalmongers, hateful of God, insolent, arrogant, Boastful. They invent new kinds of mischief. They show no loyalty to parents, no conscience, no fidelity to their plighted word. They are without natural affection and without pity. They know well enough the just decree of God that those who behave like this deserve to die, and yet they do it not only so, they actually applaud such practices. Now, lest you are looking at someone else, you who sit in chapel today, you, therefore, have no defense. You who sit in judgment, whoever you may be. For in judging your fellow men, you condemn yourself since you, the judge, are equally guilty. It is admitted that God's judgment is rightly passed upon all who commit such crimes as these, and do you imagine you who pass judgment on the guilty while committing the same crimes yourself, do you imagine that you, any more than they, will escape the judgment of God? There is no just man, no, not one, no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have swerved aside. All alike have become debased. There is no one to show kindness, no, not one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues for treachery. Adder's venom is on their lips, and their mouth is full of bitter curses. Their feet hasten to shed blood. Ruin and misery lie along their paths. They are strangers to the high road of peace and reverence for God does not enter their thoughts. No one gives thanks. There's nothing to be thankful for. No one to be thankful to. That's what makes us miserable. When I ponder this, and in the silence of my soul, I realize its truth. Then I read with new appreciation these words from the same author. Miserable creature that I am. Who is there to rescue me out of this body doomed to death? That's the question. And then comes the still small voice that we have all heard again and again. God alone, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the answer. And then may come these words, thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end.
Thank you, Bob. In sharing with you this morning, Christian friends, I've chosen a, the text that Bob has shared with you and another verse from Jeremiah. If I would perchance seem unduly serious today, as I left the office this morning, or rather as I was leaving, we got the word that a young lady who formerly was a student here just a few years ago on your campus, the daughter of one of our staff members, uh, had a tragic death this past evening. And in the text that Bob shared with you the story of Esther, the fourth chapter. We have the story of a very attractive, beautiful young lady who was suddenly confronted by the awesome possibility of the destruction of all her people. How would she dare to speak and identify that she was a Jewess when her people were condemned? And she thought that perhaps, perhaps this hour might slip by and uh, Perhaps she could spare herself. We don't know all the conflicting thoughts that were in her mind, but it was in that particular time that she said those words that Bob read for you. She said the words, or rather, Mordecai, her uncle, said these words. How do you know whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? In the kingdom, for a purpose, at a specific time, there's a, the other passage that I also would share, and I think it'll be meaningful, is from the 46th chapter of Jeremiah, the 17th verse, where the prophet says, Call the name of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the noisy one who let the hour go by. The noisy one who let the hour go by. I think you can see the relationship between the two texts without a lot of explanation. Certainly, attending the meeting of the American Lutheran Church College students here on your campus, and I want to compliment those who are responsible here for the excellent hosting, Thanksgiving holidays and all, the excellent hosting this past weekend for these students from our other colleges here on your campus. But nobody attending that convention would ever call them the quiet generation. I don't think any of you would be inclined to call your peer group today the quiet generation but I'm concerned lest anyone would suggest that perhaps an epitaph someday might be the noisy ones who let the hour go by. In the kingdom, for a purpose, at this time, I was on a plane, we were leaving Houston to go up to San Antonio, and about 30 young men trooped on, you've seen them, just newly sworn in, all kinds of masks, some of them really openly letting, letting it be known that they weren't too happy about this. Others laughing in just a little bit too high a pitch and so forth. A newspaper man said, you realize that probably one out of these 30 will not return again. And down the aisle in the plane, I was sitting on an aisle seat and across the aisle about three rows ahead of me. And I know it isn't good to talk about reading other people's mail. It seems that Governor Reagan got some publicity on doing this, but I couldn't help but see this young fellow writing up there, Dear Dick, and he wrote it big, Dear Dick, the plane is taking off. He put the period and then the exclamation point, and then he didn't write anymore. The plane is taking off. He was in. He was involved. This was it. The plane was taking off, and, and the military, Vietnam, Korea, Germany, whatever would be ahead of him, was he was committed to it. I think it applies not only to Esther here in our text where Mordecai says, Gal, you're in this. Don't think you're going to be able to hide out in the palace. God can take care of the people of Jewry without you. But you can't save your skin by keeping quiet in a time like this. And how do you know, Gal, he says to her, how do you know, Esther, that you aren't in the kingdom for this very purpose at this time? And I don't think there's one of you sitting here. I understand there's the seriousness of tests facing you also very shortly. But I think all of you are aware of a much more serious challenge facing us in the life in our particular day. And to have a sense of that hand on our shoulder and to realize it is a nail-pierced hand. The hand that poured water over our heads when we were too little to protest, maybe to squawk a little bit because of a drop in the eye or something. But that's about all. 
But it was quite a different situation when we knelt before an altar in confirmation and a pastor's hand was put on our head that prayed that God would renew and increase in us the gift of the Spirit. Because we had made our own commitments. We'd spoken words of our own confession. Just as we did here this morning, I believe in God. And unless this is just some kind of a, of a ritual thing, that nail-pierced hand is thoroughly into our life because we are in the kingdom and we're without any excuse if we do not recognize the seriousness of our position. And we're in the kingdom for a purpose. Mr. McLuhan, who's just recently, uh, we understand, making good progress after major surgery, who's well known in the areas of, of communication, new forms and so forth, has certainly revealed and and taken us some great strides in the area of communication. And yet, I, I'm frank to tell you, and Bob knows this too, that in training 32 college students each summer to be parish mission builders, it's quite a threatening situation for a man who's been in the parish ministry, most of my ministry out in Phoenix and Los Angeles. It's easy for me to talk to farmers. I come from the farm in Illinois. It's easy for me to talk to city people. This has been my whole ministry, and even to uh, youth high school age, and confirmation classes and the like. But when I had the assignment of going out and recruiting young men and young women for parish mission builders, that was a different breed of turkeys to talk to, believe me. And how do you talk meaningfully to college students? I picked up a group of devotions written by a senior student at Augustana Sioux Falls College. And I read them carefully, and one of them that I read that especially struck me was about, included in the message he was giving, uh, a clipping out of a Minnesota newspaper, a little girl came on the scene of her home burning down a few years ago, seven-year-old girl, and the people were wringing their hands and saying, I hope there's nobody in there, I hope, hope there's nobody inside, and the little girl just ran like a shot right into the house, the blazing house, and came out carrying her protesting and struggling little brother. He'd been sleeping in there, and while the rest were wondering, she did something. And you can believe it, they clapped and cheered this little seven-year-old girl and told her what a heroine she was. But just about that time, this little brother, this five-year-old brother, begins to come aware of what's going on and sputtering. He says, my kitty, my kitty, my kitty's in there, my kitty's in there. And that little seven-year-old girl went right back into the house. We don't know her motives, whether it's because she loved her little brother and was concerned about him, or maybe she loved that little kitty. Maybe it's just the excitement of the moment and just took off. But in the ashes at home, they found her charred little body wrapped around the, the kitten, the lifeless form of the little kitten. And the Augustana Sioux Falls College senior, writing to his fellow students, said, this is a picture of our lives because each one of us, in a sense, is dying for something. We race madly about and we're dying for something. Unlike this little girl, let's make sure that as you and I die for something, we die for something worthwhile. And I thought, that's a story I got to mark down. And I told Bob and the other parish mission builders that last summer. Nelson Trout is one of the other men that helps us in the training sessions. We're going to be at Michigan City, Indiana this in June this year, training another group to go out into congregations. And I thought, this communicates. I think this talks. But then I realized how our Lord Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. And in a sense... Because of my rebellious heart, I am much less than that kitten was to that little boy or to his brave little sister who gave her life for that kitten. And yet God has put his image in each one of us and in others too. And that brings us to this closing point that Mordecai made here. He said, at this time, at this time, at the Man Space Center in Houston, one of the leaders there, and it's interesting how many of these men are really dedicated Christians, said if the world were a basketball, we've gotten about so far into the illimitable space. There is so much ahead of us at this time. I was on the way up to the office in September and picked up the newspaper at the box, put in my dime and uh, flopped it down on the seat and was fastening the belt and then I stopped because there was a headline. The headline said, she wanted to be saved on her 16th birthday. That stops most preachers. It was a tragic story of a girl, 16-year-old girl, and that's an exciting time, isn't it? And her mother and her stepdad flying, the plane conked out, it crashed. 
They were bruised, ankles sprained, ribs broken. Father set out, and they never did recover his body. They haven't found it yet. And 55 days passed as the mother and daughter wrote little notes on the logbook of the plane. They wanted to be rescued. And on the 55th day, she wrote on the logbook, this is the 55th day since our plane crashed. This is my birthday. I want to be rescued on my birthday. They found only her, her bones, the bones of her mother, the remains there in the plane. But it's a picture of the world in which we live. Our world wants help. And the only, the only help is that which comes from God through his people in the kingdom for a purpose at this time. And I feel that Parish Mission Builder is only one of many meaningful ministries that stands before you and asking you to give it consideration. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunities we have of sharing meaningfully your word to us today at this time. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If the quietness of the Augsburg campus these days is construed to mean that this is a peaceful time and a peaceful, serene place, it is a mistake. The quietness of many is a frantic quietness in the face of the realization that the end indeed is at hand. Like it or not, term papers are due and finals begin a week from Monday. It's not a demon-inspired plot. It's not even a faculty administration-inspired plot. The nature of life is simply that it's got to go somewhere. And that's true in an academic community as well as in any other community of people. Creative human life has goals to achieve and responsibilities beyond individual, private concerns. Some of the goals we are directed toward are unquestionably phony unauthentic, of little value. But that's a dimension of life, too. Life on this planet is not paradise. It is not without frustration, disappointment, wasted effort, and failure, here or anywhere else. It's tempting to think that all our troubles, woes, and anxieties are the result of the place we're in, the circumstances under which we live. When I get out of this place, oh boy. And there may be something to that. But Paul's letter to the Philippians which our text comes from this morning, was written in prison. Hardly the place that Paul wanted to be. And yet he did not allow the circumstances of life to be the tyrannical master of his life. Undoubtedly, he would rather have been evangelizing the world, establishing new congregations, preaching and teaching according to his own plans and on his own schedule. But rather than crying out in despair and frustration, rather than simply quitting or biding his time, Paul transformed the circumstances into opportunities by which he continued to achieve his goals. 
He preached to guards and fellow prisoners and wrote letters of substance and encouragement to congregations and fellow workers. Although the circumstances <clears throat> were not as he would have liked, he was at work and he lived in peace. His eyes were not simply focused on the prison walls. He lived in his cell from a perspective which did not allow life to, redu to be reduced by the circumstances of the day. The presence of, of God through Christ was for him a reality, a reality, a reality which did not call him mystically out of the world or out of the situation he was in, but rather undergirded him in the situation and gave him direction and meaning. The pressures under which we live in this community and the educational system of which we are a part may frustrate and I'm convinced may stifle creative work and life. But the system and the weaknesses of, of our community need not be the tyrannical masters of our lives. We have work to do, assigned goals. But goals that will, will be best achieved if we are able in the, in the midst of our work to live in the freedom and security and peace of life, which in its deepest dimension is rooted in the love and acceptance of God, realized in the community of his people. To live from such a perspective is not to live apathetically or fatalistically. The peace of God is not a static acceptance of the status quo. Lack of anxiety is not a lack of concern or a flight from, from, from responsibility. But it is, it is in the last analysis to understand the present time in relation to God's breaking into this time. It is to understand ourselves and find our identity not simply in the relationships of the system, not simply in the, in the somewhat sterile, very often, relationship of simply teacher to student or, or student to administrator or faculty member to administrator. but in a living and open freedom and security in which we may interpret our work and express ourselves creatively and honestly in relation to one another. This place is not a prison. Any place may become one if we let the circumstances be the tyrannical masters of our lives. We ought not be afraid in our system, in our community, to live honestly, to speak and act not only in love but for the sake of justice to express ourselves, to make our needs known, but in all of that not to be unaware of the needs of others. If your life or mine is an end in itself, or if our community and its structures are an end in themselves, to be sure there is no peace and anxiety will rule. But there is another way. 
which points away from ourselves to a peace which passes all understanding and meaning which will endure in the midst of life and work as we live in honest and open relationships with one another and in commitment through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing hymn 557. When I was asked to speak for chapel this morning, I tried to find what, uh, what exactly I should say. What can a student say to relate to one or to a body of his fellow students? Well, I looked at the calendar and I found out that the date I was supposed to speak was December the 1st. Now, in line with uh, the traditional keeping of the Christmas season, the 1st of December is uh, traditionally the beginning of the Advent season. And now we have with us this morning the excellent performance of the choir and the band. And so I think this would be a fitting topic to try to start out upon. I'll try to give you a few of my ideas of what Advent means to me. If I were to tell you the traditional uh, meanings given to Advent, I suppose the word that would be synonymous to Advent would be preparation. There is more preparation done at this time of year, more concentrated preparation than probably at any other time. Now this preparation can take many forms. The first one that we see that's most obvious is the secular preparation, the preparation that the secular world takes for Christmas. Now you can take, take a look at the uh, example of downtown Minneapolis. The many weeks, months of frantic preparation to try to get that Nicollet Mall ready in time for light up night. And then, of course, there's always the stores, getting their windows ready, ordering extra stock, hiring extra personnel, doing all the things that are necessary to accommodate that extra crowd that comes the day after Thanksgiving, the traditional opening day of Christmas shopping season. All this rushing, madly rushing around is completely evident. Doesn't, you don't have to be blind to see it. There's something in the air. We know that Christmas is coming. In addition to the preparations that the secular world makes, the religious world in the institutional church also makes preparations for Advent. This also takes many forms even within the church. First of all, you have all the organizations, ladies' aid groups trying to make bazaars, you know, to get together their fancy work to sell for fancy Christmas cookies. And then there's the uh, other organizations that are planning Christmas programs, getting the young people together, trying to find a program that would be fitting the young children can learn. The choirs are preparing extra music because it's necessary to have an extra number of performances during Christmas since there are extra services. Extra services are required because of the extra people that usually do come, those loyal souls that do manage to make it to church on Christmas. So there are preparations being made all the time in the church. Next we can take a look at the home. Our preparations made in the home as well. Mother starts her Christmas baking well in advance, gets all the cookies and the cakes, candy already, and as soon as she gets them baked, she must immediately hide them somewhere to keep her anxious youngsters from eating them all before the big day occurs. Father has to go out and select a tree. He's got to cut it down to fit into the room if it doesn't do so right away. He has to make sure that uh, all of the manual uh, chores that are taken care of, such as putting out the wreaths, uh, stringing up the lights outside. If you're smart, you would have done it in November, you know, or probably October, maybe in September, to keep from getting so cold. But quite often it's put off until this time, so he ends up doing this. And then the children are also given their little tasks to do. These are usually the smaller tasks, you know, like uh, uh, trying to find places in the home to put their decorations that they've probably been making in their school classes. Now in Augsburg community, this year Advent has a, spe a special meaning for all of us, and that is that finals come during Advent this year. <laughs> there probably is no more time, or no time on the, in the life of the college campus than more preparation is evident than the week before finals. <laughs> Now we have uh, evidence of this, you know, next week I imagine there'll be a lot of midnight oil being burned. We'll have uh, students frantically learning that new formula we got in chemistry. 
or those uh, declension endings that we got in Greek, or uh, new formulas, uh, lab reports that haven't been quite caught up on, have to be handed in. And then that uh, trying to catch up on that last 500 pages of reading that somehow slipped by <laughs> through the quarter. All this has to take place. Now, amongst uh, all this preparation, there's a lot of frantic uh, anxiety that's being built up, you know, a lot of tension. And a lot of this preparation has to have a, a supreme effect upon us. Now, why is, this, why is it that we celebrate Advent? What is there correlating to Advent? Well, as I look at it, God himself had quite an Advent for that first Christmas. It started way back in, in the uh, narrations of the Old Testament, back in Genesis, right immediately following the fall. God promised to man a savior. This theme has been, from the first part, has been brought on through the books of the Old Testament. We have the prophecies, or first of all, the, the uh, raising of the serpent in the wilderness by Moses. Then we go through the prophecies of Isaiah. And many of these prophecies are repeated every year in the traditional performance of Handel's Messiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Many of these sayings come down to us as many years before the event ever occurred. And as we move on up into the New Testament, we have, first of all, the, uh, the uh, appearance of the angel Gabriel to Mary, telling her of her role that she was to play in God's role of this advent before the first Christmas. And then Mary's visit to Elizabeth, for Elizabeth then too prophesied. For all of this has been uh, a great development leading up to the idea of Christmas. Then just before the event, we have the star in the east, the three wise men. And then, of course, the night before or the night of, the magnificent angelic proclamation to the lowly shepherds. What finer fitting could we find for the heralding of a Christmas than an angel proclaiming, or a choir of angels proclaiming it. And it's interesting to note who the angels proclaimed this message to. It was lowly shepherds, not any kind of high-class autocracy that had probably built up during the time. It wasn't to the rulers, the kings, to lowly shepherds, common people like you and I. This was quite a plan. What an advent. Now this seems to me that a plan of this nature, so excellently worked out, computed to, to time that is beyond the imagination of, of mere mortal senses. Man must respond somehow to this amazing preparation made by God to bring salvation to us. It requires a search of the innermost self to look inside oneself to see just exactly what, what am I, what what relation do I have? What, what do I play in this part? There are many, there are many spiritual uh, preparations and, uh, and thoughts that must enter into this picture, as well as the physical and visual preparations made for Christmas at this time. Through all the hustle and the bustle, the anxiety of finals, through all the shopping, complete confusion that is sometimes created, we must still hear the still small voice of God speaking to us. Even when we come down to the very last wire, just before finals, cramming, trying to get all this thing memorized, still thinking forward to Christmas, even through the, all this aura of finals, which, is, which I believe is possible, we still must hear the still voice of God speaking to us. Last night, as I was reading Newsweek, I happened to look into the religion section, and here I got an interesting new insight, something that I never thought of Advent before. The story was about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, famous German theologian in Germany during the Nazi regime. Just before his, uh, or about a year before, I guess, in the, in the Christmas season of 1943, he, was, he wrote to his fiancee, uh, this little uh, 
thought about Advent. A prison cell in which one waits, hopes, and is completely dependent on the fact that the door of freedom has to be opened from the outside is not a bad picture of Advent. Now, my initial reaction to this statement was a, one of, uh, of doubt. I didn't see exactly. Now, what, what could he mean by this? Is man so pent up that he can do nothing? Do we just wait? But then, as I looked at it further, I saw that he might have a point. Because Christmas is not just historical. We don't celebrate a historical fact only. When we celebrate Christmas, we are witnessing to the fact that we believe that Christ will come again. And it is to this that we must strive. We don't know what time Christ is going to return. Therefore, there is somewhat of an aura of uncertainty. We can prepare ourselves here and now. And this we must do. But we don't know exactly what time Christ will return. So there is a space of time in between the moment that we are prepared and the time that Christ comes. Now, this can be spent in either one of two ways. You can wait passively, which I don't think is the right thing to do, or you can go forth into the world and bring the message of Christ to the world during this time. So now, if, if you take it in this way, that the waiting for Christ's return is to be one of preparation and one of doing his will in the world, then our life, our whole life, truly becomes an advent to that Christmas, that is, the second coming of Christ. Now, in conclusion, I would like to ask of you one thing. This next week, now, when you're preparing for your finals, during your study break, take a little bit of time off. Just sit down by yourself somewhere and think. And look at yourself. Look inward for once. <laughs> think about yourself. Forget about the outside world for a little while. And just look at yourself and ask yourself this one question. Am I really prepared to meet Christ? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. From the second chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, beginning at the 14th verse in Jesus' name. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make expiation for the sins of the people. For because he has himself suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. The Christmas season has become a time when we put the major point of emphasis upon the baby Jesus. Shepherds, angels, wise men, the Holy Family cozily gathered around the manger, mesmerized animals, a spotless barn, and a big star smiling down on everybody. But isn't this wrong, or at least way out of proportion? The New Testament church was really not very concerned about the baby Jesus, the birth of Jesus. Should we be? His birth is noted only in two Gospels, in the heavily symbolical narratives of Matthew and Luke, and seldom elsewhere. And it is mentioned there not because there is some interest in the birth of Jesus per se, but primarily to counteract the denial of Jesus' humanity on the part of some. Incarnation and the coming of Jesus refer to the whole of his life, and it is meaningless to isolate his birth from the broader context of suffering and death. He came to suffer and die. The emphasis should be placed at this time not on the one who came on that Christmas night long ago, 
but on the broader significance of his coming and on the fact that the one who came is the one who comes into every present moment. We speak of this terrible misnomer, the second coming, as if the Jesus who came in the first century is not going to show up again until the final time, until the end of time. The coming of Christ is every bit as much present as it is past or future. In fact, the only way in which we can know the Christ who came or will come is in the Christ who comes. And it is the one who comes in suffering that we would like especially to note today. Three perspectives. We might remember that the Jews of Jesus' time were looking for a Messiah who would come and deliver them from their suffering. Messiah did in fact come, but not as the all-conquering hero for which they had dreamed, but as one of them. He came among men as one whom they meet, not as God, but as their neighbor, one of themselves. And in flashes of faith they saw in that fellow man that suffering neighbor, their deliverer and judge, God incognito. Just as in the first century, so today, Christ comes into our days incognito, in our fellow man, in the persons whom we meet. He comes to meet us in the neighbor, in the starving, the destitute, the suffering, in confronting us with our own humanity, he is confronting us with himself. Maybe in that student who walks along, he comes. He stands at the door and knocks. Maybe in that colored person. Or are we buried in our work or in our own ideas and opinions? He comes like a thief in the night. Are our sensitivities sharpened enough so that in the specific, often thief-like situations, we will know him when he comes and do there what love requires? In the suffering of the world of man in which we live, Christ comes incognito. Always, at every turn in the road, it's that man again. Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. The destiny of man today, like the Jews of Jesus' time, depends on his reaction to the one who comes. But we must look at this coming of the suffering one from another angle. Christ comes to us today in the suffering neighbor, but also when we suffer, Christ comes in us to the world. While Jesus comes as the suffering neighbor to each and every generation, he also comes as the suffering servant. He not only suffered, but by means of his suffering, he carried out the saving purposes of God in the world. And so also today, he not only suffers, but by means of the suffering Christian, he continues to carry out the designs of God for his creation. It is through the self-sacrifice and suffering of the body of Christ and every individual within it, that deliverance comes. Maybe the question is not, why am I suffering? Is it not rather, why aren't I suffering more? Is what the Christian bears injustice? Is it not rather the suffering of Christ in him 
because of and for the sins of the world. And if the Christian does not suffer, if he does not bear the marks of the crucifixion, if he lives through his Auschwitz or his Harlem or his years in college without a scar, should he not, like the pawnbroker, take his hand and slowly push it down over the sharpened letter holder? This, this so that the Christ who comes to others in us is in fact the Christ who personally shares and bears their injustices, their fears, their hurt feelings, their loneliness. God is not a cosmic nursemaid who exists in order to make us comfortable. He's the one who comes with nail prints in his hands and his feet and he says, follow me. He who comes, the suffering one who comes, comes not only in our neighbor, but in us for our neighbor. A final perspective. Because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who suffer and are tempted. The suffering one who came and identified himself with suffering man is the same one who comes today and enters into our suffering, most often in the person of our neighbor. There's something worse in life than having to suffer innocently and that's having to suffer alone. Imagine a child lying desperately ill in some room, lonely, unloved, and uncared for. Now imagine a mother present, bending over the child, entering into its suffering, surrounding it with an atmosphere of love. There's no less pain, poverty, or suffering but the presence of the mother, or we should say, the presence of the one who comes, makes everything much more tolerable. To renounce the faith in such a situation does not improve it. It only makes it worse, leaving man to his own resources in the face of a vast, unconscious, immoral machine. The Christian doesn't suffer less for being a Christian. He should suffer more, but he doesn't suffer alone. Beside him is the one who has been through it all before, knows what he is going through, and surrounds him with an atmosphere of love. In the Old Testament, Job, Job sees God's presence in something distant and removed hidden in the power of the whirlwind. Archibald MacLeish's J.B. sees no trace of his presence whatsoever in the horrors of atomic war. The candles in the churches are out. But the gospel sees him in the one who comes, the suffering one, the roar of the whirlwind, and the distant voice on the PA system have become a person, a person who comes and takes upon himself your suffering and mine. He surrounds us with people, with people in whom he comes, so that we are not alone. The Christian may be no less helpless for being a Christian, but at least he is not helpless in a vacuum. He has a source of stability in the one who comes. Life for the Christian will still have its darkest, deepest, and most bewildering moments. But the promise of the one who comes is that these moments will be surrounded with the presence of a loving and caring God.
Let us pray. Lord God, I'm sure that you must realize by now that you are asking me to do the impossible. At least it's impossible for me. I can't love other people all of the time. I have trouble loving myself sometimes. Other people are different or disgusting or dull or dirty, and I hate dirty people. They make me sick. There are some people I don't even want to love or like or help or understand or go through the agony of forgiving. They do things to annoy me or they get on my nerves and gall me till they make me mad. Others are really enemies. Do you understand my enemies, God? How can I love the people the way that you demand, giving myself at their expense? forgetting about my own needs to rescue them. It's impossible. And yet you say that people who do not love do not know God. Don't I know you, God? I want to know you. If you can love me all the way, if you can surrender yourself into my hands, if you can give yourself to die for me, yes, if you can love me like that, you must be God, I think. But I can't see you, and I can't love, and I... And I can't seem to find a new day. I strive to pose a front, a masquerade of holy love, kindness, and community concern for others, for the ugly and the idiot. But I know the sham I have created, and so do you. You tell me all that Christ has done. You say, look, there is love. And I see and say, amen, but after that I fall. I need you, God, within me. I need some love power driving me, driving me to love, to forgive and forgive, to accept forgiveness from those I cannot love. Can you make me Christ, God? Can you? Please, God, may others who have loved show me that power now to love the loveless and the dying to forgive the unforgivable and the lying before it is too late. Tie me to Christ and make me over again, for Christ's sake. Two texts, if you will, one of them from the Bible, the other from Robert Frost. The text from John, the third chapter, which was read recently in chapel by Dr. Olala. There was one of the Pharisees called Nicodemus, a leading Jew, who came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God, for no one could perform the signs that you do unless God were with him. Jesus answered, I tell you most solemnly, unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I tell you most solemnly, Unless a man is born through water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised when I say you must be born from above. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. That is how it is with those who are born of the Spirit. How can that be possible, asked Nicodemus? You, a teacher in Israel, and you do not know these things, replied Jesus. I tell you most solemnly, we speak only about what we know and witness only to what we have seen. And yet you people reject our evidence. If you do not believe me when I speak about things in this world, 
How are you going to believe me when I speak about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but have eternal life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. No one who believes in him will be condemned. But whoever refuses to believe is condemned already because he has refused to believe in the name of God's only son. On these grounds is sentence pronounced that though light has come into the world, men have shown that they prefer darkness to light because their deeds were evil. And indeed, everybody who does wrong hates the light and avoids it, for fear his actions should be exposed. But the man who lives by the truth comes out into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what he does is done in God. Then, from Robert Frost's Christmas poem, 1958, titled, Away. I read it, I suggest, because I think there is a relationship between Nicodemus on the one hand and the perspective of the poem on the other. Now I out walking the world desert and my shoe and my stocking do me no hurt. I leave behind good friends in town. Let them get well wined and go lie down. Don't think I leave for the outer dark like Adam and Eve put out of the park. Forget the myth. There's no one I am put out with or put out by. Unless I'm wrong, I but obey the urge of a song. I'm bound away. And I may return if dissatisfied with what I learned from having died. The question that I should like to ask this morning is just this one. D do you really believe? Do you really believe there were shepherds on the hills watching over those flocks by night when they were interrupted in their reverie? Do you really believe that an angel spoke to them? Do you really believe that there were wise men who came from the east who inquired of Herod and Herod's wise men where the king of the Jews was to be born? Do you really believe that an angel warned them to go home by another way because Herod was anxious to find out something from them? Do you really believe that they brought gifts to that barn where Jesus was born, gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Do you really believe that the shepherds on that cold Judean night left their fields and went to Bethlehem and to that inn and saw that child? Do you really believe that there was this, this heavenly host up in the sky that just filled it and sang glory to God? Or we might ask other questions. 
Do you really believe in the time of Elijah that that axe had floated on the water? Do you really believe that those trees spoke to one another in the book of Judges? Do you really believe that Jesus is true God begotten of the Father from eternity and true man born of the Virgin Mary? The Gospel of John uses the language of faith and unfaith. Not the language of ignorance and knowledge but believing and not believing. And this morning, I raise those questions not because I want to, to have you insist in chorus, I believe, I believe, I believe. Because I should like to point out that faith is not the response to a religious statement. It's not, as Nicodemus supposed it was, a religious action. Faith is not being in chapel, nor is it being absent from chapel. Faith is not a detachable thing done in the midst of other things. It's not the acceptance of the historicity of a biblical story. It's not the belief that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. To believe is to apprehend all human action in its relation to God. Not to believe is not to recognize the only context in which human behavior can be anything but trivial. The man who believes is the one who recognizes that every visible human act requires for its fulfillment, the invisible action of God. The man who believes doesn't suppose that this religious action, our gathering here, is somehow a complete action. The man who believes recognizes that this religious action or that this religious action of speaking in chapel needs for its fulfillment the invisible action of God. That's what I think Nicodemus missed. That's what I think the perspective of Robert Frost's poem misses. Forget the myth. There's no one I am put out with or put out by. Unless a man is born from above by that invisible action of God, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord our God, we ask that you would come to us in our faithlessness and in our arrogance and complete our weak and ineffectual actions and bring them in and under the dominion of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Thank you for coming to chapel this morning. You were forewarned. I said to Pastor Monsager that a college president should not have his popularity put to the test by having his appearance announced the day before. It would be much safer to assume that you are here by virtue of habit or out of fear since next week, next week is test week and you may need all the help you can get. <laughs> I will read this morning the familiar Christmas story, but I'm going to read it from the New Testament in today's English. You may have seen this volume which has been put out by the American Bible Society and a distinguished alumnus of Augsburg College, Dr. Ralph Mortensen, who worked for many years with the American Bible Society, sent me a copy of this the other day, and I want to read the Christmas story in this version. At that time, Emperor Augustus, who founded the city of Augsburg 11 years before the birth of Christ, set out an order for all the citizens of the empire to register themselves for the census. When this census took place, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Everyone then went to register himself, each to his own town. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the town named Bethlehem, where King David was born. Joseph went there because he himself was a descendant of David. He went to register himself with Mary, who was promised in marriage to him and was pregnant. While they were in Bethlehem, the time came for Mary to have her baby, and she gave birth to her first son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. There was no room for them to stay in the inn. There were some shepherds in that part of the country who were spending the night in the fields taking care of their flocks. The Lord's angel appeared to them, and the Lord's glory shone over them. They were terribly afraid. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for I am here with good news for you, which will bring great joy to all the people. This very night in David's town, your Savior was born, Christ the Lord. This is what will prove it to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great army of heaven's angels appeared with the angel, singing praises to God. Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to men with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them back into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened that the Lord has told us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and saw the baby lying in the manger. When the shepherds saw him, they told them what the angel had said about this child. All who heard it were filled with wonder at what the shepherds told them. Mary remembered all these things and thought deeply about them. When you read the Christmas story in a different version, some new things come out to, to your consciousness and I think one of the things that struck me as I was reading this is the fact that in the first Christmas story you have all the earmarks of busyness and activity and movement. You've got coming and going and traveling and hurrying and seeing and singing and talking and selling and gawking and giving. But then comes this quiet contrasting line with its note of reflection and thought. Mary remembered all these things and thought deeply about them. That word thought deeply or the word that is translated thought deeply is an interesting one. In the other versions it's the word pondered. It's from a Greek word which means to throw together. And there ought to be times when we take all the experiences of our lives and, and throw them together in some kind of a, of a mental mix so that with the silent synthesis of thought, 
we can get some kind of meaning to all this. This is possible only when there is time for reflection and deep thinking. Now we've had complaints this fall about the fact that we just haven't had time to think. Things have been so pressured, so fast moving, that there doesn't seem to be time to remember, to reflect, and to think. A telescoping of activities due to the calendar, a lot of high expectations on the part of the faculty, a measure of sincere acceptance of responsibility on the part of students, all of this has put us under the gun, so to speak, and we all feel there isn't time to think. Now, of course, if this is a complaint, in a sense, this is a very healthy sign that people complain that there isn't time to think at all was a time when the only thing the students could complain about was the fact that they, didn't, they couldn't dance. Now they say there isn't time to think. Well, I think this is a more significant issue, <laughs> much more. It reminds me uh, of, a, uh, of a book that came out some years ago entitled What Lutherans Are Thinking, and it came in for quite a bit of uh, jibes and uh, some fun because people would say, what, Lutherans are thinking? Or what Lutherans are thinking? Or, uh, what, Lutherans are thinking? Well, uh, one could uh, make the same kind of a play on the concern for st that students have for thinking. But seriously, the whole of society, in school or out of it, finds so little time today to follow Mary in thinking deeply. And to sense this need is to realize a great lack in our own generation. In a publication which came to my desk the other day entitled The New Student, there is an article in it by Harvey Cox of Secular City fame in which he writes an open letter to Allen Ginsberg, the poet of the hippies, who had asked the question, what is Christianity going to do about the hippies? And uh, Cox considers the question very seriously and and he, he replies in terms of, of the, the kind of questions that this sort of dropout subculture is, is placing before us. And he asks, have we looked with real candor at the price we exact from the young in emotional deprivation and the erosion of the affective side of life? in order to fit them into the niches of an increasingly rationalized and complex society. Are there some inner values of the garrison, competition, success, performance society about which Christianity should ask some very telling questions? Where in the world of jet schedules, omnipresent deadlines, incessant phone calls, and numberless good causes to support, do we discover places to meditate, to touch the inner selves of those closest to us, to make love unhurriedly, to walk nowhere in particular, to examine the astonishing structure of a child's ear. Maybe you and your shocking friends are reminding us of something about Christianity we had almost forgotten. The rhythm of dropping out, listening, and then dropping back in. I confess I still perversely hope that you and most of the hippies will drop back in someday. Maybe this elemental oscillation between withdrawal and action is something we all need much more than we are willing to admit. The elemental oscillation between withdrawal and action, the rhythm of dropping out, listening, and then dropping back in. I wonder if this isn't one of the opportunities 
of the Christmas break. A chance to drop out for a while, for a few weeks to pause, to rest, and to think. I like to think the chapel at Augsburg is also this time for withdrawal and reflection in the middle of our workaday lives. Because here is a chance to think some thoughts that there isn't time to think otherwise. This is our moment to drop out, to listen, and then to drop back in. But I suggest that maybe this is what we can use some of the time available to us now as we go after examination week, home or wherever it may be, to just think a little, to think deeply. And may I suggest a point of departure for your Christmas thinking? One question, one question. Why is there so little joy and gladness in academia? Where is the fun of it all? Why is it such a grim, grimy thing? This is a Christian college. The message of the gospel is joy, happiness, gladness to all people. I don't care who you are, but where is the joy of it? Maybe you haven't forgotten, as I can't forget, that last line in the speech of one of those characters the other morning in the Spoon River Anthology. You've got to live to love life. Maybe that's the problem. You've got to live to love life. You've got to live to have the joy of living in college. And as you think about this, maybe you will hear the words of one who said, I have come in order that they may have life, life in all its fullness. Some of us believe that that's the key. And that with the sun you have life. And with life, you can enjoy life. And there can be some happiness and gladness, even while living and working and studying at college. Think about this, will you? Have a thoughtful Christmas. Drop out for a little while. And then come back, please. Amen. A few passages of scripture this morning as background. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the body of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands upon them. And from the twelfth chapter of 1 Corinthians. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the organs in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single organ, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. 
But God has so adjusted the body, giving greater honor to the inferior part, that there may be no discord in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And finally, from the third chapter of Galatians. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ to put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I wish we had one compulsory chapel each term so that everybody in the college could get the essential message, whatever it might be, and we wouldn't have to depend upon the yeast principle, a little leaven leavening the whole lump in order to get the word through. But since we haven't a communication system which can say, now hear this to every person on board ship, we have to rely on you, the faithful fraction, or perhaps the frozen few, <laughs> to take the burden of the message today to the entire college community. To begin this new term, I would like to make a few statements for your consideration. You may not agree with them, but for the moment at least, they comprise some important assumptions on which our college is operating. First, we are a community of persons, voluntarily united for the achievement of certain objectives. Augsburg is people, persons, individuals with all the problems and possibilities to which being humans makes us heir. We are persons, not a conglomerate of amorphous groups, a student body, a faculty, or an administration, but persons who have volunteered to live and learn and work together. There is no compulsion about this community. None of us has to be here. We have all voluntarily assumed our respective places, accepted our ex respective roles, acquired our respective responsibilities as free human beings. We are each one responsible for being at Augsburg and therefore are not in the position to stand aside and fix blame for situations in the community, but rather to accept responsibility for all of the conditions, good or bad whether we are backward or bickering or static or progressive or exciting. Our unity, if there is any, must be found in our common objective to become more mature, free, and capable individuals through the pursuit of truth wherever we find it. In other words, we are united primarily for an educational purpose, and its fulfillment is up to every person. Second, we are a community with Christian affirmations. This means many things, and we're constantly struggling with this meaning. This much is certain, however, that as a community with a Christian viewpoint, we operate on the presupposition that we are equals. The fundamental context of our existence together is the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom, there is no difference according to rank or age or sex or accomplishment. There can be no second-class citizens in the kingdom. We are all one in Christ. Here there can be no Greek or Jew, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free man, but Christ in all is all in all. The natural tendency toward hierarchy is denied as contrary to the divine will for human beings in community. So while we must make for convenience sake distinctions as to who are students and who are faculty and who are administrators, nevertheless we are persons created and redeemed together living and working in the analogy of the body where there are differing functions, but no one part can say that it has no need of any other part. And for any part of the body to take unto itself more importance than is natural, 
or to re refuse the responsibility it has been given is to endanger the health of the whole body. All must have the same care for one another. And in this context, students have as much importance as faculty or administration. Faculty as much important as students and administration, and administration as much importance as students and faculty, that there be no discord in the body. Yet, there are conflicts. There are misunderstandings. There are gripes. There are problems. Murmuring was found even in the pristine church, so lately visited by the Spirit's outpouring. A legitimate complaint was lodged. Somebody wasn't being cared for. Inequities existed. Perfection had not been achieved. The heavenly community was not yet in heaven. Those who murmured were not scolded. There are instances in the Old Testament where murmuring is visited with divine retribution because it was allowed to become corrosive and destructive. The gripes of the Hellenists were not ignored or slapped down. Action, healthy action followed. Structure was created to meet a need. And administration entered the church. There were those who were called then to be administers, servants to the apostles and the congregations, both faculty and students, if you please. No institution can run itself. Faculty must give itself primarily to teaching and research, students to study and personal growth. Someone needs to serve the institution and its goals, the faculty and its requirements, the students and their needs. Thus, administers, administrators, are your servants for Jesus' sake. We are not here to serve ourselves but to serve you. Like these deacons of old, we are not here to build up a glorified diaconate, but to make possible the best conditions under which faculty and students can work to fulfill the objectives of the community. Three things are necessary for this service. Resources, and we're constantly seeking them. We don't have enough of them, human or monetary. We need communication, and this always seems to be breaking down, but it's a challenge to keep it open and alive. We need cooperation, which is absolutely essential for the maintenance of the body of the community. In the fulfillment of these essentials, we oftentimes fail, and for your forgiveness, we plead. But for the utilization of resources, for the maintenance of communication, and for the achievement of cooperation, structures are necessary. Channels, instruments, sometimes just plain committees, where people can meet in dialogue, discuss, decide, recommend, act, and implement. Only by the use of some structure can orderly solutions be reached for our community problems. Only by the use of structure can necessary changes be made, and these structures must be used until they prove themselves ineffective, in which case there is always recourse for changing the structure itself. No structure or organization or constitution is immutable. These can be changed to serve rather than becoming tyrants to be served. Perhaps the most dramatic incident instance in the past few years of the orderly use of structure to achieve change came in connection with a highly emotional question whether or not there should be dancing on the Augsburg campus. Students had discussed the matter. Student personnel had discussed it. Faculty had discussed it. Student faculty, the student faculty committee carefully weighed the issue and made a recommendation to the faculty. The faculty considered the matter and recommended to the administration that the administration, in turn, seek approval of the Board of Regents for a change in policy. And much to the chagrin of some who would have loved a big, fat demonstration in order to have something to demonstrate about, the matter was taken care of, a significant change was achieved without serious injury to the community. We are constantly faced with issues. There are changes which have to be made. 
and we should be busy with trying to affect these changes in an orderly fashion. I have seen the list of names under a petition to keep the library open during chapel. Whether you think, it, uh, whether you think so or not, this has some serious implications for the conduct of our college, which declares itself a community in worship, as well as a community in search of truth. But let the matter be discussed. Let it come to the student faculty committee. Let a recommendation be made to the faculty. And let the community speak as to how it desires to be served by the administration in this regard. Do I say this to suppress gripe sessions or petitions or demonstrations? Not at all. These can serve to point up issues and generally to liven up the place. But I speak as I do for orderly process and unashamed confrontation among persons and groups on this campus because we've got a task at Augsburg that is bigger, bigger than student power or faculty power or administrative power bigger than any individual or group of individuals. The task is the creative evolution of a college that will prepare people intellectually and spiritually to meet the crises of an urban society and a world grappling with wholesale death and destruction. If this is going to be just another college without goals, without uniqueness, without vigor, without relevance to this day, to this city, to this society, and to this world, and without the cross of acceptance of humanity's agonizing needs, then I want no part of it, and neither do you. But simply because I see this institution as facing the biggest opportunity it has ever known in its century of history, namely to dedicate the finest tool of education we know how to fashion to the solution of man's deepest problems in the sacrificial spirit of Jesus Christ. I believe we need the idealism, the imagination, the virility, the guts of you students who believe in what Augsburg stands for. Be prepared, therefore, my young colleagues, to take part in the decision-making that will mold this college. Be prepared to take part in the institutional planning that will chart the course of Augsburg by participating, for example, in the massive study now being conducted under the auspices of the Faculty Senate for an academic blueprint for our college in the 70s. Student participation must be as important a part of this activity as faculty participation if it is going to be more than a tinkering with the status quo. I believe what we need is a united pitch-in, a willingness to participate in a total community effort, an academic coalition, if you please, that will pitch in to build a great college the model for which has yet to be constructed. Pitch in and examine the objectives of the college. Ask if they are what they ought to be and whether we are fulfilling them. Pitch in and learn the facts about your college, what its policies are and how and why it is operated as it is. Pitch in and formulate your legitimate concerns as full-fledged members of this community. Pitch in and make the structures work, which can involve the entire community in changes for the better. Pitch in and struggle for a great college, not to fulfill petty personal desires, not to prove your activism, not to get merely the excitement of producing sound and fury, which signifies nothing, but rather to effect such change as will make this community worthy of our struggle, worthy of our academic heritage, and worthy of the name Christian, because it glorifies God by serving his people. Let us pray. O oh God, none of us are equal to these things. Unite us by thy spirit in the task which thou hast given us. In the name of Christ, amen. The gospel lesson for the 
festival of Epiphany is recorded in Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. We are, for the most part, a serious and practical community. We have neither an abundance of leisure or wealth. It's the middle of the winter, and it's pretty cold. Except for the fanatics, skiing isn't even fun when it's 20 below. It might not be too bad today. At least it's the beginning of the term and not the end. Things were pretty grumpy around here before Christmas, and I shudder to think what they could be by the end of February. In self-examination, Soren Kierkegaard tells the story of a very wealthy man who desired more than anything else to own the finest team of horses in the world. He finally found that team. They belonged to a king, and he bought them at a fantastic price. But after having the team for less than a year, they had degenerated into something completely other than what he had bought. They were listless and weak though they were well fed. They lost their gait. They had no pride. They were just a couple of nags. The owner was disillusioned. And finally, in desperation, he called in the king's coachman to see if he could give him any idea whatsoever what the problem was. The coachman stayed with this man for one month, and during that month, he drove the team. And at the end of the month, the team of horses had regained its luster and its gait, and once again were the finest team in the whole country. The royal coachman knew who the horses were and how they were to be driven, what they were capable of, and he directed them in relationship to that. The owner simply had bought the horses and did with them what he would do with any dumb animals. We may intend life or we may simply be intended. We may live creatively, or we may simply be driven. We may be moved, 
but not be moving ourselves. It is possible for life to become simply a matter of what has to be done. The endless struggle, the routine tasks day after day after day. And when this happens, the happiest among us becomes a grump. We become irritated with ourselves and with one another because we aren't becoming, we aren't being that which we really must be. Creativity is stifled, productivity goes down, spontaneity is lost. Even horses can be something less than horses. But we are human, and to be human is to intend life, to be dynamically and decisively involved in what we're doing and in our relationships with one another. The three famous wise men in our text this morning took a ridiculous trip led by a star. A dangerous trip, an expensive trip. That which intended their life was their faith that something had happened in the foreign city of Bethlehem that related to their existence and their destiny, and they wanted to participate in it. They believed that the Christ had come, and though some would say they were simply goofy astrologers, they are symbolic as Gentiles of the universality of the gospel, and they are symbolic with their gold, frankincense, and myrrh of the extravagance of worship. Worship, the life of faith, calls us not only into the tasks of life, into the work of life, it also calls us out. It calls us, if you please, away from the books, away from study, away from worry, into that impractical dimension of the transcendent, the spirit, our relationship with God. Now we live in an age when God talk is very often regarded as completely irrelevant. We live in an age which is secular. Nevertheless, I am convinced that to be human is to be called to live from a perspective which takes us beyond and above simply the humdrum and routine and practicality of the tasks which face us every day. Worship calls us out. Not, not to an unrelated life, to be sure. The wise men didn't stay in Bethlehem. They went back to their homes. But the trip made all the difference. If we are to intend our lives, if we are to live creatively and meaningfully, retaining our perspective in relationship to that dimension of life which is transcendent, which relates us to God and through Christ with one another, I'm convinced, at least in this community, is absolutely necessary. We run the great risk of overextending ourselves as an individual and as a community, of becoming too practical, of acting only out of necessity. I think of Jaroslav Pelikan's book, Fools for Christ, a book about Dostoevsky and Bach and Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, men who wasted their lives on tasks which could hardly be called practical. Yet these men did beautiful and foolish things. They penetrated into a depth of life 
relating beauty and goodness and truth in an unusual way to our mundane existence. Hard work, responsibility, other people are not to be forgotten as we worship God. But life reduced to absolute practicality is hardly worth living either. We are called as a community and as individuals to seek the truth, to discover meaning, to realize ourselves, not simply in the practical dimensions of work produced, but in the creative and dynamic dimension of relationship with each other and with God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, keep us from going under with that which is ever there to be done. May we retain our perspective through faith with thee and in relationship with one another in order that the beauty and goodness and truth of life might penetrate into us and through us into this world. We seek to be your people and pray for your presence among us that that might be possible. Forgive us for our neglect, for our insensitivity, and direct us as thy children, as creators as well as creatures, to that which thou wouldst have us be and do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. chances of my getting it off again. I would like to read for a text this morning a portion from the first chapter of Romans, the 16th and 17th verses. This is taken from Good News for Modern Man, one of the modern English versions of the New Testament. For I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts men right with himself. It is through faith alone, from beginning to end. As the scripture says, he who is put right with God through faith shall live. In some ways, I think this is one of the most comforting passages in the New Testament. Apparently, all that is necessary, according to this epistle, in order that man might live, is that he have faith. Now, having faith would appear to be a simple matter. So simple that one wonders sometimes why there is so much anxiety expressed today in the church and in the church colleges over the difficulty which modern youth are supposed to have concerning having faith. Particularly, it seems to me, it is puzzling why there is so much concern among the people of the church over why the faith of the youth should be put to such a severe strain in, of all places, the colleges of the church. Doesn't it seem that if we really do 
have complete confidence in the gospel. The task of the Christian college ought to be a simple one, to simply inform young people, if they have not already been informed, as to what the gospel is, and then to do all that we can to persuade them to have faith in the gospel. Now what I propose to do today is to reflect with you as much for my own sake as for anyone else's. Why it is that colleges like Augsburg believe that it is important to study matters of faith, religious and otherwise, as rigorously and as critically as possible. In a sense, I think that concerned people in the church are right, but I think that they are using the wrong reasons. Briefly, I think that they are right in wondering why it is that the faith of young people is put to, to so severe a test. But I think that they are wrong in supposing that this is because we in the colleges assume a critical attitude toward matters of religious belief. In the prologue to his rather delightful poem, Thus Spake Zarathustra, Friedrich Nietzsche portrays a meeting between Zarathustra and an old saint of the forest who tells Zarathustra that he praises God by weeping, laughing, singing, and mumbling. Zarathustra is quite properly, I think, puzzled by these antics. And he leaves the old saint in the forest and says to himself, could it be possible? This old saint in the forest hath not yet heard of it that God is dead. To many people, it appears that in assuming a critical approach to the study of Christian belief, we run the risk of the student concluding that God is indeed dead, if he ever lived at all, and that the behavior of the Christian in his supposed acts of worship is no better than the weeping, laughing, singing, and mumbling of the old saint in the forest. Now, if a critical approach to the study of religious belief runs the risk of alienating the student from the Christian family, would it not be wiser for the college to adopt a less critical approach? Now, one apology for choosing the kind of critical approach we do exercise is provided by a quotation from the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. He says, Religion, on the ground of its sanctity, and law, on the ground of its majesty, often resist the sifting of their claims by rational thought. But in doing so, they inevitably awake a not unjust suspicion that their claims are ill-founded, and they cease to command the unfeigned homage which is paid by reason to that which has shown itself able to stand the test of free inquiry. The usual defense of the critical approach to the study of religion is often made on grounds similar to those of Kant. And this defense is essentially correct. Within the Christian family, 
There are a variety of claims and points of view. And when points of view conflict, it is quite obvious that not all of them can be true. Indeed, it is sometimes the case that none of them may be. To the extent that it is the responsibility of a college to help its students to distinguish true claims from false ones. To that same extent, it is the obligation of the college to subject religious claims to the same critical scrutiny as we would apply to any other area of knowledge. But it is precisely at this point that the problem arises, it seems to me. If we seriously entertain the possibility that some religious claims, and admittedly even Lutheran ones, and possibly all of them with regard to a certain article of belief are false, then it would seem that the faith is in danger from precisely those people who would most naturally be expected to defend it. Perhaps you noticed that in this last sentence, I shifted from using the term belief to using the term faith. Notice that in the translation we used, the term Paul uses is faith, not belief. My shift from using one term to using the other was intentional because I hoped to raise in your mind the question of whether faith and belief are really synonymous terms. My contention is that they are not. Many people, I think, <clears throat> suppose that genuine Christian faith is dependent upon accepting as true or believing in the truth of certain statements, assertions, claims. But notice that this is not what Paul says. Paul says that faith is a way in which man is put right with God. He does not say that faith is a matter of having the right statements, the right assertions, the right beliefs regarding creation, original sin, and so on. Hence, it appears that men who have faith, that is, men who have been put right with God, may nevertheless disagree vehemently as to how certain theological matters are to be understood or talked about. I think that one of the most helpful ways of putting the point is to say that faith is a matter of accepting the gift of God which puts man right with God. It is an act of acceptance, an act of adopting an entirely new outlook on life, which indeed does not solve our intellectual, theological problems, but which does set the mind at peace with respect to the assurance that one is set right with God. Now this is the framework then in which I think it is quite possible to say that there are men of faith of many denominational affiliations who differ not in the presence or absence of having been set right with God, but who do differ in their beliefs as to how these complex matters are most properly described or talked about. In this framework, then, I think it is possible to understand how people of faith 
can examine, criticize, differ, doubt, even despair over creedal statements without losing the faith. As Paul says, it is the gospel, God's gift to man, in which we need to have complete confidence. And this confidence is possible, even though we may indeed not agree on the appropriate language to be used in describing or talking about it. And it is this context, I think, which makes it possible for sincere people of various denominational affiliations to sit down together as children of God and to talk about their differences and to resolve them as all children of the same Christian family.